We are going to try to focus more on the divestment side than the investment side. Terribly tempting though it is to try to cover both because they are integral to one another. But I just want to quickly um, share with you uh, some of the approach that uh, uh, Mercer takes on this question and uh, insight that we have on it. Now, this slide's pretty hard to see, but uh, just to frame up the conversation, we do understand that climate risk is the number one risk that's coming up on major studies such as this one from the World Economic Forum. Um, Mercer's undertaken a major study. I'd love you to... Uh, oh, I've just jumped to several slides. Um, on climate risk, and uh, we looked at four scenarios. We developed climate risk factors to model uh, investor portfolios and to look at where the risks and where the exposures are from a climate point of view. And we look at this in terms of an investment return impact by asset classes, but also importantly at the sector level. So obviously oil, coal, gas, utilities, materials are the areas where investors are most focused as regard divestment um, and also what, how to swap out and move the dial from brown to green. So the portfolio modelling has been developed in collaboration with institutions. Uh, we've been doing this work since 2011. So we've now, over the last six years, developed tools and processes for investors to really come to grips with what is it that is undermining the value that's being driven through climate risk and what are some of the um, ways in which we can swap out the brown for the green. And so we do this in terms of um, risk tools, looking at uh, the way in which climate risk actually reduces your ability to meet your investment objectives, um, increases the numbers of negative years of return, as well as the impact on your investment returns. Um, we have developed portfolio modelling tools. And as I said, it's really been a learning process with a group of investors and we've been using live portfolios to do this work. So I would really love to share more with you on the significance of this work and to also share with you the idea that the world is moving and that we are interacting with investors all the time that are coming to look into the analytics of their portfolio and to quantify what climate risk means. So there's a worldwide progression and here in Australia and New Zealand as well, we're seeing some of our major investors looking into these issues very seriously. So the key things to really look at is how to measure and assess the climate risks in your portfolio, how to establish what is your risk appetite around these issues. Um, engagement is obviously key and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that this afternoon and the role of how to dial it down and decarbonise and obviously divestment, our topic for today in this session is part of that, looking at carbon lowered indices and pure plan thematic investing. <laughs> this is just a quick snapshot which many of you would be familiar with of the divestment, fossil fuel divestment um, industry, the uh, pledges around 3.4 trillion and some facts and figures there about divestment. I think these slides will come onto the website so you can take a look at these more closely. In the US and UK, uh, Mercer has been working with Divest Invest and undertaken surveys with signatories. And there's been some interesting findings about, uh, early findings about what is driving the Divest Invest pledge. And you can see there that those investors that have uh, pledged to divest from fossil fuels and invest in climate solutions are really being driven by three key things. Ethical issues, um, having a good understanding of financial issues and wanting to make, as I think Stephen Heinz said, a political and symbolic statement very important. So those three elements are what are coming through from other regions in terms of divest, invest. Um, important to starting on the journey, as I think Stephen 
mentioned is really to set your objectives and then to undertake measurement. And I think Max will also talk today about the importance of assessing the risks and uh, measuring the risks in your portfolio. So this is some of the work that we do with investors to look at the exposure to fossil fuels in your portfolios um, and also to try to develop a more nuanced view. So not just an absolute emissions um, number, but to look at what is it your exposure to cleaner technologies and using a variety of metrics in order to get a more sophisticated view, view of what we mean by uh, carbon and fossil fuel exposure. And finally, something that I think is really important and in our experience is a process for going through the question of divestment. And we do a lot of work with boards and investment committees to take uh, clients through an analysis process of their own portfolio, but more importantly, perhaps a process to develop a consistent methodology to address the question so that you don't have to rethink the question every time the issue comes up. And we've developed an analytical tool that has uh, algorithms and the tool actually facilitates, helps facilitate a workshop where we work through what are the impacts of divestment uh, to risk, to return and to reputation. And so the tool actually guides you through a number of questions about these issues as how they pertain to your portfolio and actually uh, suggests some decision-making frameworks and how to think about the results. So um, I'll be happy to talk to anybody about that later. So with that, I might introduce our uh, first speaker who is going to speak briefly, um, Max Horster. Uh, we're very lucky to have Max here. Um, Max is a partner at South Pole um, and he's done a lot of work on the uh, measurement and assessment of carbon and climate solutions. And I suggest that you refer to his bio on the website because I don't want to take up our precious time. I'd rather he, he exercise his brilliantly large brain and um, challenge us on this question. Um, but please feel free to read his bio. Over to you, Max. I'm, I'm standing up in order to, um, to stay awake. Really, I came in this morning. Um, landed at five o'clock and a friend of mine slipped me a little sleeping pill, a shady friend of mine, before I boarded the plane. So I did get some sleep, but um, if next time you board the plane, read my CV, it will put you to sleep as well. <laughs> um, thank you very much um, for the introduction. So uh, South Pole Group, we are based in Zurich in Switzerland, and um, we are 150 climate change specialists doing basically two things. We measure climate impact for around... Um, a thousand companies, governments, agencies, and so on, and we help reduce this climate impact. Um, you might know us here in Australia through our subsidiary, Climate Friendly, and uh, you might also know that we are uh, represented here towards the financial industry through our partners, CARE, who are also in the room. Um, we started measuring climate impact of investments uh, in 2010, about six years ago, and um, back then uh, we were much less busy because there were not that many investors looking at the topic. But I've, I've been asked in the in the preparation for this um, for this panel to speak a little bit about the international um, dimension of this. And I think the first observation that I would like to make is when we started looking at climate impact of investments, we realized that climate impact is or has been looked at very differently in different geographies. So in Europe, the focus was very much on the demand side of fossil fuels. So in, you know, since I started off with the sleeping pill in a drug analogy, the drug users, not the dealers. So the drug users would be the utilities, the materials companies, the guys who buy fossil reserves or fossil fuels and burn them in order to produce electricity. While in the U.S., over the last six years, this very powerful divestment movement started that is represented here, and that is more focused on the dealer side, on the supply side, so on the companies um, that have oil, gas, and coal reserves. And so, therefore, in the U.S., um, where the divestment movement became so big and then spilled over to other countries, you have this focus on 
on companies um, with reserves. So you have this, this large call for divest from the carbon underground 200, the 200 companies with the largest oil, coal, and gas reserves that are listed, the former carbon tracker 200 list. So this is how we started to see um, kind of the focus on climate impact among investors um, going at different paces and, and, and with different focus points over the last years. And this is now converging. And that's actually quite interesting. So now a sophisticated um, look on climate impact is taking many more dimensions into considerations, into consideration. And, and um, it's actually quite interesting to be in a room where there are some who are starting on this journey and some who are already more advanced and to, to basically see what the topics are that they're dealing with. So on the topic of divestment, so on the topic of, of investors who decide to no longer invest in certain companies or assets because of their climate impact. Um, from our point of view, it's very important to look at the motivation of why an investor is doing this. And I think um, from the Rockefeller um, uh, contribution this morning, we saw a mix of these motivations already. It's typically, it is a mix of motivations, but it makes sense to look at them individually. So the, the first motivation that you have is kind of one, kind of a pure idea to say, I do not want to finance assets that contribute to climate change, to basically stay clear out of that. Just my investments should not have anything to do with that. And that was actually the first wave of divestors who did this, typically mission-based investors, as we heard this morning, you know, who don't want their mission to be in contradiction with the way they invest their money. I, I think we, we had this beautiful example of, of uh, cancer research and smoking. You know, you don't want to contradict your mission. The second group um, that, you, that you will find is basically those of activists who want to send the signal, we heard that this morning as well, into the market and saying, I, I will divest from a certain company so that this company or civil society or a general public hears that I'm not in line with what, this, what the business model of this asset is. Um, this this would, be, would be the second group. The third group is a group um, that is very much around risk, right? So I don't want to be invested in companies that will be impacted by a carbon bubble, by stranded assets. You, you heard that risk concept this morning as well already. So, so, um, so this, is, this is again kind of one motivation. And the fourth one is actually that of compliance. And that's an interesting one because that is relatively new. There are more and more regulators and governments out there who are asking, currently still in a very friendly manner, investors within their jurisdiction to consider divesting. And um, one example has been named um, this morning already. Uh, you know, France, in the run-up to COP21, to Paris, basically said, we want all institutional investors in France to report on their climate impact for the business year 2016, the one that we're in, in 2017. So as we speak, institutional investors, every institutional investor in France is either looking into this or pushing this to their asset managers. This is only about transparency. This is not divestment, right? They want to get this transparency. But in the ripple effects of this, you saw the likes like AXA to announce that they will divest from thermal coal. AXA, large insurance company with a lot of subsidiaries like Alliance Bernstein and so on, who do this, um, Allianz and so on. And then you might have seen that it was not as prominent because it was after COP21. Uh, a landslide move happened in the United States. The commissioner for the insurance industry, Dave Jones, insurance industry in California, he's responsible for 1,300 insurance companies, quite a lot of insurance companies in California. He basically said two things. He said, I, I demand you to report your climate impact. That was six weeks ago or so. And I want you to consider divesting from thermal coal. So again, it's a friendly ask, but it is basically this fourth motivation to be in compliance with what is ultimately um, yeah, somebody who has a say on what you're, on what you're doing. So these, typically a mix of these motivations leads investors to consider divestment and to go about it. And the, the next question that they typically have is, so what does that mean? How do I do it? Um, where do I set my thresholds and so on. And there I would like to show you something. Could I ask you to um, so, so this is this is a free tool that is online and it's you can find it on decarbonizer.co 
I think it's, you know, because it's free, we saved on not paying for the com domain. It's probably somewhere in Colombia, so I don't know what CO is, but it's not com. And, I, and it's basically something that we, um, oh, I have to reload, let's see if we're online here, um, that, um, that we developed for divestors, and let's hope it works, or for investors to try out the impact of divestment. So what you can do here is basically you can upload um, a portfolio, um, or you can, this is something that we did with uh, 350.org, you can use an existing portfolio. So let's use an, an example from Australia. So that we, I know a lot of people worked on that future fund, right? Um, this was end of last year, the value, it's hard to read, it's 36 billion, I think, US, um, the equity portion of the fund. And you can then decide how, how you want to decarbonize, because decarbonizing is very much in the eye of the, um, of the investor. So you can say, let's eliminate pure play coal co um, companies. Let's eliminate companies that invest in oil sands. Let's eliminate companies with reserves. That would be the coal 100 and the oil 100. Let's eliminate inefficient polluters. That's very much the logic of the carbon footprint, right? So companies with a comparatively higher carbon footprint. And then you can set a threshold of uh, how much, you know, what companies you want to eliminate that have a certain percentage of revenue from thermal coal. So this is the typical, currently typically used divestment threshold is 30%. So you see that with, I think with AXA, they say um, everyone above 30% revenue um, is being divested from. Um, there are some caveats to that. I can maybe come to that in the discussion, but it's, it's what we're using. And then you can decide how you want to and let me stop that now because it always takes a second. How you want to uh, invest the money that you, uh, that you just freed by divesting. And so in this case, we decide to invest in green companies. And now it, of course, has to work. Oh, yeah, it does. Good. So what it does is, down here, you see in the middle the unclean portfolio and to the left the cleaned portfolio, right? So the first line is the carbon footprint. 360 tons of CO2 per million dollars of revenue versus now 190 tons of CO2. Um, then you see we increased the green exposure of companies, and then you see some, um, uh, some other uh, um, metrics. But what's interesting here is, and sorry for... It actually also backtests how much money you would have made or lost if you would have done that three years ago, right? So just backtest the portfolio three years ago, and you see Future Fund could have made 1.5 billion in excess, in returns, neat little gadget, and you see the, the, the impact then, sorry, down here, um, the portfolio versus the, the benchmark. So this is, um, I'm, I'm showing you this because to, to open up the discussion about what divestment actually means and what, you, what questions you have to answer in order to be able to divest. And with this, I would like to end because I probably went over time probably already. Thanks. Great, thanks, uh, Max. That's really great. I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Councillor Aaron Wood. Um, Aaron's really a sustainability business expert. He has a Churchill Fellow. He's done some um, fabulous work, including with uh, education with children. And he's really been working in this area for um, the past 16 years and brings a lot of experience uh, from the City of Melbourne. So, thanks, Robert. That thank you. Rather brief intro. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, when I get a nice introduction like that, I always have to qualify it with the fact that my father was my primary school principal and I spent more time in his office than any other child and it wasn't for good behaviour. Uh, but I've run a, a company called Kids Teaching Kids for the last 16 years. It's an environmental education company. He now works for me on minimum wage, so I've had the last laugh. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> So uh, I want to talk a little bit about our experience, and I've been told to, to focus uh, on divestment. Um, there'll be a little bit of an investment talk as well. Um, but what happened uh, last year, late last year, was that a motion which was sort of two years in the making um, was brought to fruition and we moved a, a motion to divest. So I'll talk about the mechanics of that, but also sort of the policy context um, the reasons why, but then the impact on that as well. And I'm also going to show you the, mo the motion uh, up on the screen as well. So this is a little bit of the why. I'm not going to labour that. Um, we've heard a lot of the opening presentations talk about the sort of impacts that we're going to see. I guess one of the, the things that I will highlight, though, is that 
Um, the Black Saturday bushfires um, that happened in 2009, we lost um, over 170 lives, so extremely catastrophic, uh, really horrific for, for those families, um, particularly up in some of the, uh, the most beautiful areas surrounding uh, Melbourne, but it literally came to the doorstep uh, of Melbourne. Uh, for any of, the, of you that are from Melbourne, uh, I was there on that day. You literally, you know, it felt like you couldn't uh, breathe the air. It was, it was. You knew something bad was going to happen um, that day. What, what's less known, it's becoming more known now, though, is that in the lead up to that Black Saturday bushfires, uh, we had a heat wave. Um, it was a, a, a week uh, over 40 degrees, which me being from Mildura. I felt like Melbourne was a little bit soft um, because that's what we get every summer. But the, I guess the critical part of that was that um, due to heat-related illness uh, and stress, particularly in the very young, uh, the elderly um, and those who were suffering illness already, we lost over 370 lives um, due, to, due to that heat wave. So when you talk about the reason to act, um, there's an economic reason, uh, there's certainly an environmental reason, and now there's a huge health reason to act as well. So why would cities um, be interested in this? Um, we've heard about the investment community, and we've heard about some of our, our funds and the reasons that they're moving. Um, we're going to hear about um, super. We've heard about the insurance industry. Um, the reason for city governments to get involved in this, I will again refer back to Paris. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to be part uh, of that COP21. And what we've had there is, like every other group building towards Paris, you've heard, had a very strong city movement building towards Paris. So the C40 network, um, which is actually Mike Bloomberg's network, um, you've got the, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, 100 Resilient Cities Network, all putting a focus on the role of cities. The reason being because cities produce more than 70 per cent of emissions. So there's a huge uh, opportunity to reduce emissions, but they'll also um, suffer you know, most of the most significant impacts. Um, a lot of this movement was born after Hurricanes Katrina uh, and Sandy. So what people like Bloomberg uh, and the Rockefeller Foundation have recognised and all of the city governments which are signed up to things like the Compact of Mayors is that if we take action in our cities, we can have a huge impact on that, that carbon budget, if you like, but we can also make our cities much more resilient in the process. So City of Melbourne uh, is carbon neutral, has been um, since 2012. We're very proud of that achievement, but we're less than 1% of emissions. So when you talk about uh, our zero net emissions strategy, which is zero net emissions by 2020, if we truly want to reach that target, then we have to work with every partner the investment community, with our businesses, with industry, uh, with our residents, with the transport industry, um, right across the board. We have to bring data, we have to bring sound research, but we also have to take action. So just briefly, very briefly on the investment side, because leading up to the divestment situation was a slow build of the reason to take positive action. So things like uh, our zero net emission strategy, uh, what came from that was uh, smart blocks aimed at apartment owners to bring down their emissions. 70% of people in Melbourne live in apartments in, in the city of Melbourne. Uh, for our commercial building owners was the 1200 Buildings Program, low cost finance for them to take action to make their buildings greener. The National City Switch Program was aimed at commercial tenants. Um, we've worked on our transport strategy, our walking strategy. So you can see all these things kind of on the investment side of things. And then further to that, changing the energy mix uh, for our city. Um, we will soon go 100% renewable energy uh, for the city of Melbourne. Uh, at a date uh, soon to be announced, um, we'll actually go to market for that to build new renewable energy. So that's, the, the, that's all I'll talk on, on the investment side of things. Um, city of Melbourne is one of the fastest growing municipalities uh, in Australia. Interestingly enough, it is a growth area. So we talk about growth areas being on the fringe of cities. Uh, city of Melbourne is growing uh, very, very fast. Again, huge opportunities, big threats. Um, we need to ensure that our city is far more resilient into the future. So this is the zero net emissions strategy. It's a really clear strategy, again, backed by sound research and data that sets out all the areas that we have to hit uh, if we want to meet that zero net emissions target. Part of that is changing our energy mix, stationary energy, uh, public transport, our residential buildings. Our commercial buildings are more than 50 per cent of our emissions, so that's a really, really big focus for us. Waste management, even water, all of those different facets are all rolled up into the zero net emissions strategy. And we've had a lot of good uh, achievements as part of that. If you didn't know, we're the world's most liberal city, five years in a row. <laughs> Just letting you know that. So, so if Stephen is, is still here, you know, great that you visited Sydney. If you want to come to the world's most livable city, you're more than welcome. Uh, 
But we're not one of the world's most sustainable cities, and that's something I heard about integrity and honesty, uh, and that's something that we've talked about very strongly, is that when you look at you know, places like Denmark and, and you, know, you look at Copenhagen and these sort of cities, um, we are not one of the world's most sustainable cities. It's a time-based term to be the world's most livable city if you're not one of the world's most sustainable cities. So we're very focused on bringing ourselves up the ranking uh, of sustainability, and part of that is to divest uh, from fossil fuel because that's a big part of the equation. So this is the, the motion that was two years uh, in the making, uh, and what it does, it's, it's, it goes as far as I can ascertain as any uh, local government motion has gone. I was, a, I was acutely aware, having grown up in Mildura as an environmentalist, uh, which is a pretty tough path to tread, I can assure you, uh, I was a, really aware of it being seen as a protest vote or, or sort of a, you know, a knee-jerk, um, you know, something which really didn't matter or something which had too many caveats on it. You know, we will do this if it doesn't harm us and you know, we still you know, have money coming out of the sky and that kind of stuff. This um, motion has, has many different parts to it on purpose. It looks at our transactional banking, um, which is probably the, the lower uh, end of the impact. It's only about $400,000 a year. Um, but it also looks at our, our investment strategy. So we actually had no investments in fossil fuels, but that was by default. It was enacted uh, as policy uh, as of November 2015, after the motion was passed in October. So that now prohibits so the word is prohibits any investment uh, in fossil fuels or fossil fuel exposed companies. Um, the next part of it though, which is really important, is uh, Vision Super, our default super provider. We've got about sort of 60 or $70 million uh, in the employee selected um, a part of that super. But the defined benefits scheme is something where we have really strong control over. And again, sort of $70, $75 million there. But the other thing it does, if you look at the, the last um, part of the motion, is it talks about the transactional banking services and financial facilities, which for us was a, was a big step because, for example, we have a line of credit with ANZ for, for $70 million, which we're using to redevelop um, the Queen Victoria markets. Um, so when that sort of thing comes around again in future, uh, it'll be subject to uh, a fossil fuel exposure survey and some of the tools which have been uh, highlighted here. And through that process, um, what we will do is attack, I guess, all facets uh, of, of um, the city business. So I just want to talk briefly about the impact. Um, there are some of the impacts in terms of a dollar, uh, uh, dollar figure. But I guess the, the other important one is sort of the progress we're having with Vision Super, um, because that's, uh, I guess, uh, somewhere when you talk about the insurance industry, huge gather of capital, um, the, the, the super industry in Australia has a, a huge role to play. Um, so the letter went out to, to Vision Super. Um, they came back with their response um, that they were, uh, they were own, they've owned, they own wind farms, that they were making lots of core changes in their investment strategy. Um, they invest in international companies that have a 70% lower carbon exposure than the rest of the market. So they came back and essentially told us, look, we're doing lots of good things. We've already done a fossil-free uh, investment option previously, and there wasn't that greater uptake on it. And our question back to them was, how well was it promoted? And it wasn't promoted at all. So the second time around, I guess the challenge to everyone in the room, the challenge for us is um, I, the final upshot of that, and this is literally as of last week, our CFO met with their CFO again. Um, the two respective CFOs have recently met and they're open to actively exploring the option to develop a fossil-free investment portfolio for the City of Melbourne defined benefit in their sub plans. So um, our thing now too is that's the defined benefit um, for the employee selected option. What we want to show them is that when they make that available next time is that we get huge uptake. And I guess that's a challenge for, for us uh, and for the divestment movement is we can't just ask people to divest uh, but then not encourage um, that to deliver for them when they make that move. So um, to finish, City of Melbourne won't um, reach a zero net emissions strategy uh, if we don't change our energy mix. Uh, investment is a large part of that and taking action uh, as a city government is a large part of that. But divestment, in all honesty, is a crucial part of the equation because it 
drives that 99% which we're not responsible for um, uh, as actively as any sort of physical project can. So we see divestment not as some sort of protest movement, not as something which community groups uh, are only involved in, but something which we know the investment community is taking very, very seriously. And if you talk about the charter of a, of a city government to be responsible to its ratepayers, to its citizens, uh, if we're not tackling climate change, we're failing in that duty. Okay. Thanks, Saren. Um, I'd like to introduce my um, friend here, Bill Hartnett. So uh, Bill's been involved in the superannuation industry and this industry for about 20 years. And he's at, you know, one of our really our leading funds that have done some excellent work on climate, uh, policy-wise, etc. Very innovative. Um, and with that introduction, I'll pass over to you, Bill, and you can explain more. Well, oh shucks. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, look, you know, I have been in this industry for a a long while. In fact, uh, one extra day today, so you can say happy birthday to me. Um, and uh, um, I'm just overwhelmed at you know the huge amount of numbers uh, that are here uh, today, and how much our uh, progress is uh, continuing in this area, and, and also in the idea that um, you know what we might have done before has been pretty good practice. Um, I think it's uh, very exciting that you know. Tomorrow's best practice, or today's best practice, won't stack up tomorrow, and there's a hell of a lot of innovation that come through here uh, going forward. Um, I'm just going to do a few brief uh, comments here. I haven't prepared any slides or, or anything about that, but I just want to put a bit of a perspective on it from a superannuation um, side of things. Uh, I've been very fortunate to work at local government super for almost six years now. Uh, we're an open offer fund, but we've been around to look after local uh, government members of New South Wales who um, the investment committee and the board always saw from an early days had a very strong um, tie to grassroots sustainability issues. Um, and our trustees reflected that as well. And this whole area, and I think you got it from the Rockefeller's uh, presentation beforehand, is absolutely essential that you have to have some core set of beliefs up the top of the organisation to do the sort of things that you've done, that we've done. Um, and I'll go into those a bit more, including in, in, in the area of divestment. Um, so clearly we have had that, you know, that ability to do that, that uh, alignment with our brand, with our members, and uh, to differentiate ourselves. Um, but there was also a very strong belief from local government supers um, trustees um, from the very you know, outset. Uh, we've had climate change within our policy, for example, for about seven years. We've had a responsible investment policy for many years. We started divesting of other areas, such as tobacco, back in 1999. Um, so this is uh, you know, something that's been very uh, intrinsic to our beliefs, but probably what's even more important um, is that it's been done across the whole of the fund. So we haven't been one that's just going, well, let's just set up a sustainability option that may or may not get promoted. It's actually very hard for a superannuation fund to promote individual member options um, because you have to be so careful about the level of advice that you give out, general advice as, as opposed to personalised advice, that you, know, you might want to say this sustainability option is great, but you, know, you cannot say that because you don't know exactly what everybody's uh, individual investment circumstances are. So promoting uh, individual funds can be very hard. Um, we've taken it as a across the whole of fund approach um, for everything that we've done in sustainability. And um, that's on top of the, the branding type issues, it's that ESG risks um, we see as being important long-term risks. And superannuation investors are different from the rest of the investment um, chain. We're meant to be future looking. Uh, we're meant to be long-term. Uh, we've got this incredible mandate and privilege to be actually try to think long-term. You know, I don't think we, all of us do it. Um, very few of us can do it. We don't do it as well as we should, but we've got the mandate and the ability to be able to do it. And we're also universal owners, so we invested, you know, we probably have 10,000 individual securities across 10 or 12 different asset classes in Australia, internationally. You know, for us, that means as a long-term investor, and what differentiates ourselves from other investors is that we cannot escape externalities. 
negative consequences of activities um, do impact. You know, investments in coal mining might be, you know, profitable, and certainly not at the moment, but in, historically they have been. Um, but, you know, the pollution impacts are very detrimental to other parts of our um, portfolios. Um, and, you know, being a, a universal owner, it's very important to try and raise the bar. Uh, essentially, our policy is just saying, well, you know, we only have a small investment team. We've got external managers, but we're just saying, you know, well, if we want to make a better investment environment, is an environment where companies are well governed, um, so, uh, you know, societies are cohesive and environments are healthy. I mean, if you can start doing that, then you're going to get some reasonable ways for you to start making investments and good, solid investment returns for your members. Because that's what we come back to. We're a fiduciary. When you start making these decisions, and this is probably a big challenge for superannuation funds, is this whole area of being a fiduciary. Um, it is a very underexplored area. Being a fiduciary means you have to work in the best interests of your members. Really, that's, it's such a throwaway line. It's a great opportunity, but it's also a, 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 a great way of stopping conversation in this whole area. Because what is best interest? We're saying, well, you've got to, you know, if you get out of one sector, you could be, you know, losing the opportunity to make great investments in that area or returns from that area. Um, it, it's a very rudimentary type discussion that's been going on there. It doesn't get tested very much. Um, but with the food, and, you know, it is going to be tested more, and, and I'll talk a bit more about how we've tested it. It brings a lot of tensions in for a superannuation fund. And that is, and challenges for trustees to, to act as a fiduciary to incorporate climate change as, a, as an issue. Because, you know, financial industry is short term. Um, we've got a hell of a lot of agents in between with their own ideas on what makes a good investment as well. There's a lot of perpetuating of business as usual. Um, there's a lot of perpetuating, well, we can't really make, you know, look forward. We've just got to keep on, whatever keeps coming through, we'll just keep on financing it. There's not a great understanding of systemic risk. I mean, we can uh, adjust this to, you know, uh, talk about climate change and fossil fuel investments. You can talk about GFC. You can talk a lot of bubbles that have been there throughout history where we just go a bit like lemmings over a cliff. Um, everything's going to be okay until it's not. Um, with superannuation funds, we're also at the top of the chain in many areas with very little transparency and little push from our investors and members. So, you know, you can perpetuate that. And when you have the area of where your um, uh, trustees uh, got legal responsibilities to make sure you make a damn good investment return for your, uh, for your, for your, um, for your members, um, it creates a pretty risk-averse type um, environment and uh, decision-making process. So the process and governance, which is my final area that I'd like to point out, is really, really important. Um, divestment is something that LGS has done, um, but we've also done several other things. We're measuring our carbon footprint, and we know that very well on our Aussie and international equities. Uh, we have over $700 million in uh, low carbon assets, which I define as low carbon assets, across five different asset classes. So we're regularly looking out for things in property, in clean tech private equity, in infrastructure, in green bonds and these sorts of areas. Do they stack up from an investment? Can you get it in there? We do a lot of work on engagement and advocacy. There will be carbon burn over the next 30 or 40 years. We have to be careful on how quickly you go, you know, if you divest everything holus bolus, you introduce systemic risk, you introduce, a, you know, a lot of um, problems. So engagement and advocacy with companies that you think might have the ability to think long term, who might say, well, we're going to have a carbon constrained future. How can we adjust our businesses to be, that, to be effective in that way? I'm a shareholder. I own a lot of money. I, you know, I have 70, 60 million dollars in BHP. Um, that's what I, you know, shock horror. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, that's what we do as a fund because we haven't excluded with them. So what do you do? You engage with them. How can you be responsibly looking after your future over 20 years' time? That's what you want to do as a shareholder in its long term. Um, you, you want the board to be thinking long term. How are they going to see their business in 20 years' time? How does climate change adjust that? You can do that very effectively as a shareholder. You can also do it, also, I'd say, by divestment. That comment on symbolism um, I thought was very interesting before because our divestments have been quite small, but they've been quite impactful in that, okay, here stands up an investor who says, no, 
We're not going to do exactly what has been perpetuated and done before. We're going to do something different. It really does make boards um, take a bit of attention. But, you know, you, so as, as a super fund, you can do many things. Okay, our divestment. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, we introduced our high carbon sensitive screen. Um, this was after two years of work. I was very fortunate. We had a lot of negative screens as it was um, across the fund, so we were just reviewing more. Um, and the high carbon sensitive screen took about two years of work to get through the investment committee. It's a pretty, I don't know, um, a poorly worded or, or a, a, a obtuse sort of um, screen, but the idea was to try and capture the companies that we thought were most susceptible in the sectors most vulnerable to climate change risks. How do we set it? We eventually got to setting it at a 33% revenue threshold for companies involved in coal mining, uh, oil tar sands and coal-fired utilities. Um, it was uh, involved us either excluding or divesting of about 25 companies, um, 25, about $25 million for us it was. Um, it was about 1.6% of the MSCI world. It's probably now, two years on, about, it's about 0.8. That's how badly the sector has gone. Um, it, it took, how did we get the investment committee there? Well, you know, I, I, and was that figure right? No, it's not right, but it's what we came to, you know, and, and uh, there is no figure that's not right. There's no exact perfect answer here, but it was certainly, you know, and I applaud the, the board for looking very much at, well, what do we do as long-term owner? So we were looking at macro factors. We were looking, this was well before Paris, we were looking at Copenhagen and two-degree limits. We were looking at regulatory change. We were looking at market change. We were looking at pollution in China. How can you continue to do the same sort of things that you've been doing? Stranded assets, the carbon tracker work was very, very important. And that understanding that we're going to, you know, we can't continue having fossil fuels being invested in up to here. We've got to try to get it down to here. Okay. So that's where we'll just uh, tie it up now. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, but um, we'll um, be open for questions later on because I've got quite a bit about reporting. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd just like to um, also have the chance for people here to ask questions, uh, but perhaps just to kick off for those of you who are funds who are taking a long-term view because that's really what we're talking about. The issues we're talking about today are both strategic issues, but as I hope we've um, helped um, inform you about today is that they're also issues that we're seeing impacting investment returns now and um, into the foreseeable future. So short-term action is required, medium-term actions required, and longer-term strategic planning is required. Uh, could I just ask um, the panel, for those of us here who sit um, and are involved in the investment process, what would be the number one thing to do so that when people walk out of this room, they feel, yes, here is an important step that's been absolutely critical um, for us, us to start to decarbonise the portfolio. Um, could I just ask if each of you just to reflect briefly on that? What is the number one thing that you think is critical? Um, uh, uh, setting investment beliefs. Okay, great. Setting investment I, beliefs. I, I think that's Couldn't number one. That, you know, climate change is a, a, you know, a significant issue for one. It's us written on our policy, but it's the number one ESG risk. Um, but that takes a bit of time to get to that position. That, so you've yes. got to entrain that. I mean, if you can get that, then you can work on various processes. Yep. Thanks, Bill. So um, this is a bit beyond me, Helga, because this is not my, my sort of area. Um, but I would say that um, one of the things that was coming pretty loud and clear out of COP21 and has been building for quite some time is how do you, um, when cities are going to do most of the heavy lifting uh, in the short term, we're also uh, responsible for the largest part of emissions, mm -hmm. is how do you unlock those sort of uh, international and national funding arrangements and get that money direct to city governments, which are, um, if you look at the, the latest report from C40, um, I think it's something like 25 to 30 per cent of the uh, emissions reduction in the next five years can be met by cities. Um, yeah. how, do we, how do we unlock 
uh, that that funding flow, I guess, to to things like you know cities which are aggregating you know large scale energy consumers and then you know effectively giving the market offtake agreements. Mm. Um, and then looking for, for, for financing bodies to come in and, and actually provide that finance. Yeah. I will say, though, that already, um, if you look at Bank Australia and, and NAB, for example, they came in very early into our 1,200 buildings program, mm-hmm. and that offered really low-cost finance for, for building upgrades, which was, a, which was a big injection to the program. Right. Fantastic. Yep. I have two of those. I don't know which one works. Okay. Um, I, th- I mean, the first, the first step is, of course, to... Um, after the after the beliefs is to measure. You need to understand what your exposure is to currently to greenhouse gas emissions, to future emissions such as reserves, to companies. Um, are they on track to transform, to become two degree compliant or not? And what is your exposure to those? So measurement is the first step in order to be able to manage. And I think um, that that measurement step, as natural as it sounds, is pro- has probably not been done by a lot of people in this room yet. Um, yes, I, I, oh, I don't need it. Okay. I just realised. Um, yeah, I would agree, and uh, I think as I hope I've uh, demonstrated, it's very important to bring the board along um, on this issue. And in our experience at Mercer, we do a lot of work with boards and investment committees on setting the investment beliefs or principles. We found that's absolutely first principles and foundational. Uh, in order for it to be a strategic issue, it, it needs to be picked up at the board level and owned by the board and then the investment committee and from there to be articulated through the policies and then pr- investment process and then ultimately to be reflected in where the money is going, where the capital is allocated and, as we've said before, sort of moving that dial from brown to green. Can I also ask um, each of you, what has... Um, absolutely not worked in your experience in this area. Let's save our um, fellow travellers here from stumbling into the potholes that we have along the way. Is there something that you would say, don't even go there? I can say one. Um, I I moved a motion to uh, remove uh, our former business advisor to Tony Abbott uh, and that went down uh, unanimously. So um, pr- perhaps don't get beyond your <laughs> remit as a city government would be, would be my message. But um, I guess on the flip side of that, I'd say um, my message about the, the divestment kind of lead up was that it was two years uh, in the making. And then the other thing that I, that I did, I, I, was, I was very careful about sort of learning all the ins and outs of the divestment movement. 50.org were, were, were really great in the initial stages as well. But then getting around to other local governments had gone down the same path. Um, and then the other thing was sort of um, not trying to do it as a stone-throwing thing and, and sitting down with our CFO and saying, you know, as an organisation, what are the impacts going to be? Is this actually going to mean something? And then what is a motion which is going to be logical, reasoned, easily backed up and extremely defensible when I go out and speak about it. Mm, very good. Yeah, I think that is what is critical and uh, it's so important to have evidence and I think that's where this, uh, you know, the quantitative information, really understanding um, what the evidence is, doing the analysis and so on is terribly important in this area because, it, as we know, it can be a very emotive issue. Bill or Aaron, did you have uh, any...? i just say, you know... Pick your battles. Uh, take your time. You 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 want to get to that divestment. You know you want to start divesting. You want to reduce your carbon foothold, um, footprint. But you you have to bring the people along with you because yeah. um, they have a lot of um, yeah. other conflicting um, well com- well priorities. Priorities. Yeah. So you yeah. know you just just going too hard. Um, where it's all care and no responsibility just doesn't work. Yeah. So, Aaron, do you have any quick? Max, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no worries. No, the um, the I think I, I saw quite a few in this kind of wake to to invest more climate friendly two hindrings um, that I found quite annoying. So kind of things that didn't mm. work. And one is certainly the endless debate between um, divestment and engagement. So seeing this as a 
um, one or the other option and one is better than the other and, and as long as I, I engage in this conversation I have basically a uh, carte blanche for non-action um, so I think it, it needs to be seen as, as different options for different investors um, in mm. this area and the other lengthy discussion is on methodology so again mm. a big excuse for inaction is to basically dive deeper and deeper and deeper into finding the perfect methodology that will never exist so um, perfect as the enemy of good um, is the other one. Yes, great. Yes, analysis paralysis is something that we uh, investment consultants particularly do very well. I uh, don't recommend it and I think that's so important that um, we take the methodology as we have it. It will improve. We've already seen it evolve significantly and yes, I think that uh, debate between engagement and divestment is something that every fiduciary will have to come to, but it's really important. I did want to open the floor to questions because I'm conscious we've, we are a bit pressed for time. Um, or Aaron, did you want to quickly? Oh, just a really quick one. Um, based on um, Stephen's comment earlier, is um, you know symbols are important. So divestment is yeah. in some ways a symbol. Um, sort of following on the back of Max's um, comment is that the action is also symbolic um, in, in in a sense. Um, and and so I think we have to do both things really quickly in, in this country. Yes. Um, so what we're twinning divestment with is if it was divestment alone, it would just be symbolic. Yes. Right. But we then point to you know, our renewable energy programs, we point to our commercial building programs, our you know, residential programs, and in that way what we're saying is we are transitioning to a different type of economy and we're going to play our role in it. And we're going to be honest about it because I, I think that's the thing in Australia is we've got to be honest about this. Mm. There's, there's yesterday's business, there's today's and tomorrow's business, so it's not even future business. Mm. Does Australia want to be part of today's business and future business or are we going to end up a third world economy? Yeah. Nicely put. Okay, questions. Thank you. Michael Salvatico from MSCI SG Research. Uh, just quickly, for those who don't know, as well as doing the investable indexes, we also produce the environmental research, uh, portfolio risk tools and indexes. <coughs> there's, there's currently $46 billion invested in environmental indexes, MSCI environmental indexes. But uh, when you compare that to the 9.5 trillion following MSCI, MSCI indexes globally, um, it, it's still a, only a small amount. A, a large part of what I hear came uh, was reflected in what Aaron said about uh, the the asset owners saying, "Well, you know, we are doing something. We've got a couple of small funds. You know, we're, you know, we're we're investing in in renewables." Um, is, is that sufficient? I mean, how much of the portfolio needs to account for climate risk? Is, is tinkering around the edges okay. enough or do we need to change our core investments? Well, certainly when we... Thanks, Michael. Um, when we looked at this whole area of divestment, you are looking at your core um, uh, portfolios. Um, and it's international equities in particular where you've got to be concerned of. If you're doing a lot of divestments, it's in your international equities. Um, holdings, it's surprising. It's not that many in Australia. Um, but what it brings up, I think this whole area will be, our, all our bail screens have got rid of, well, we got out of about 8 to 9% of the MSCI world at the time. And a lot of consultants would get very uncomfortable about that. You know, what sort of risk does that bring in? You know, what sort of tracking error? So I, I think the way that you do that, um, because it's, it, in many ways it's easier to do that than to find renewable energy deals, because they, they can be very, very hard and writing off big checks for deals that don't go well because of policy issues or, or things like that um, is, is tough. But the divestment area and developing sort of large-scale strategies that are without your most egregious areas of, of concern, you can certainly do. We've been able to get rid of 10% you know, um, of the MSCI world and develop portfolios, be it via index, be it via, you know, you know beta-type strategies, low active um, uh, investment strategies that meet the risk return hurdles that the trustee wants to get, the investment community wants to get. So if you can get that, you actually start breeding in quite a bit of innovation. And when you start, you know, to keep them comfortable, you do a lot of reporting on it. So on our low carbon screen, um, that, for example, introduced what we were saying, that was 25 companies, it was introducing eight, eight basis points, 0.08% of tracking error, so variation from the benchmark each year. That's what, uh, that's what it's done. 
but the additional returns actually added 16 basis points of returns by being out of those sectors, purely by being out of those sectors. And then you get a manager that can start to play around with, well, how am I going to get those different ways of getting the sort of returns that you want? So uh, that's, I suppose, a bit more technical, but it's what an investment committee needs to know uh, to get comfortable with getting out of various areas and, but knowing that they can still get the risk returns that they're trying to get for each asset class. And I think um, performance is key. I think the elephant in the room is, are we going to be um, undermining our very important investment return as endowment and foundation investors and other sorts of investors? And I think what's critical here is that we do the analysis in order to swap out um, products which have a similar risk and return characteristic as... Bill saying so. I think it's it, that's really important is to, to understand the return drivers. And I yeah. must. I was just going to quickly say that um, some work that we've done with some endowment funds has been actually to look at all of their investments and their strategies, and then to see where there, whether there are like alternatives um, which are more sustainable, have higher exposure to cleaner technologies, lower carbon, etc. And I think that's the way to go to sort of look at the volatility all the traditional risk and return factors that you would look at with any investment, um, but also to look at this kind of premium that this sustainability or the green element can provide. Yes. Can I, okay, so again, I didn't understand any of, any of that, Bill. So, um, but, no, well, I'm, I just I'm, wanted I'm to joking. say we double return good. for the risk. I understand that, so, I understand that. That's good. And That's we had a 20% lower carbon footprint in our portfolio. Excellent, so I understand that, I understand that. My thing is, and I guess the question is, you know, when you look at even the climate science, you know, we're tracking above the models in every sense, and, and each time it comes in, mm. it's like, oh, geez, guess what? We just, you know, everything is a record. Mm. Is <laughs> asking the investment community what happens if the rate of change is happening far quicker than you know? Mm. So when you're measuring your risk, what are the tipping points to how you, you measure your risk? And one of the things is the black swan thing. Yep. You know, I sit on a couple of boards is we don't deal very well with black swan risk. Mm. Uh, and I feel like, and, and this is not to sort of make everyone go and jump off the Sydney Arbor Bridge, but I feel like the, the black swan risk is actually more, much more likely when you look at what we're doing with climate and then in turn with our investment. And then I would think that um, getting back to Michael's question is, is what, how much should be moved is I would be moving as quickly as bloody humanly possible because I think the tipping point is coming far quicker than we know. Yes, good point. Yep. Thank you, great panel. Um, Lou O'Halloran from AEGN. I just I want to pick up on what Aaron just said because so much of the value that's in our current um, fossil fuel intensive assets is not transparent. I mean, the value's probably not there. And, um, you know, it goes to all of the, the carbon budget that work that's been done. When the argument is put forward that there is value in these stocks, how does the investment beliefs work relate to that? Because it is a belief. It is about a belief that things will change, but there is no market evidence for that. There isn't, there isn't enough for a, uh, you know, for an investment committee often. Mm. Well, the way that we do it is to actually look at the portfolio itself with the board or with the investment committee. And really the, the investment belief is about framing up where you want to go, direction of travel. It's really a first principles statement. But then you look at the concrete evidence of what you have in your investments today and you try to match up the two. And in order to match up the two, you have to have a good understanding of what are the economic drivers for the value that, ha that you have in your portfolio today? And in the work that we've done over the last six years and in our most recent iteration of this work, you can see that where value is being undermined is really in at the sector level. So often institutional investors tend to look portfolio top down. It's really looking bottom up and many investment managers understand this very well. So it's actually taking a more granular look at what's in your portfolio. What are the risk return and reputation drivers? What's hitting on those? And understanding that these are issues that have to be managed promptly and in the short and medium term. So um, I think you've got to have the evidence base. You've got to quantify it. And I know later today uh, there's a session coming up 
which looks at the fiduciary aspect, which is also critical to it. Um, but because we can quantify the impact of climate risk, um, we can then relate it back to the way in which the fund is going to invest. Now, I know we're almost uh, we're at time, so um, I know we've sort of raced through and uh, been a little bit messy, but uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, where things are at in terms of divestment from these uh, particular perspectives. So I'd like to thank our fabulous panel, um, Bill Hartnett, Aaron Wood, and... Uh,